Okay, we're ready to start. Hope you're enjoying the uh, first part of your week, and uh, hopefully the latter part of this week will be without incident. Got some uh, congregational announcements to, uh, to share with you, some reminders, and then we've had some updates, some changes to our prayer list uh, since we were together this past Sunday. So, um, regular folks kind of pay attention and, uh, and then we'll, we'll update you. Uh, if you have, parents, if you have a, a junior, uh, junior high, middle school or, or high schooler, uh, the uh, sign-ups for both Junior Impact and Senior Impact are, are up and going. And uh, we need, you know, you, you don't have a spot until uh, you've, uh, you've reserved, you know, registered and paid. So keep that in mind. Also, registration for both junior and senior camp is up and going. Hey, uh, Brent, would you do me a big favor? Would you make sure I turn that uh, uh, system on downstairs? You know, you know what I'm talking about? The, uh... Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. It's on the shelf behind the refrigerator. Yeah, it's for the uh, it's for the uh, hearing devices. Yeah, that too. Um, so keep that in mind. Uh, kids ministry playground picnic is this Sunday right after Bible class. Lunch will be provided. You're asked to scan uh, the QR code in the bulletin uh, if your family plans to attend. So. Uh, Keep that in mind. This is uh, for young families. Uh, media room class will begin a new study. Next Wednesday night, they will be studying the book Kingdom Authority uh, by Tony Evans. So uh, that, that new study will start uh, next Wednesday night. Senior Sunday is April the 28th. Please pick up a bulletin uh, for information about uh, Senior Sunday. The congregational gift uh, is, uh, you know, is uh, an option if you'd like to do that. We have 16 uh, graduates this year, so uh, going to be a big, big class uh, for, for, this, uh, for this, co this coming uh, senior year. Ladies are invited to a bridal shower honoring Hannah Masterson. This is the bride elect of Brock Inlow. That shower will be Sunday, May the 5th from 1.30 to 3.00 in the fellowship hall. So keep that in mind. They are registered at Zola.com and Amazon. So uh, that might help you with uh, uh, gift selections uh, for this upcoming uh, bridal shower. Uh, today from four to six was another work day for uh, Vacation Bible School. There'll be another one this coming Sunday. And uh, if you're just looking for something to do, ladies, Daniel gave me a file folder with an array, and uh, uh, these are cutouts. You're supposed to cut the, don't do like I did. I tried to do one a while ago. Uh, it, it ended up being some kind of therapy because it didn't look anything like this. So we've got a stack of these. These are leaves and uh, things that they'll be using for decoration. Uh, and so if you want to come up and get four or five of these, I, I wouldn't recommend any more than that. And then uh, just bring them back here. Uh, it doesn't have to be Sunday, but uh, anyway, that's just one of those little deals that has to be, uh, needs to be done. And uh, several of the, of the teenagers were doing that. Like I said, I did one, one. It was actually this one, because I thought it would be easier. And mine ended up looking like a stick figure. I don't know what happened. Uh, but anyway, they didn't, they didn't keep it. They, uh, you know, they, it, got, it got tossed. So, well, I'm so glad you could join us. Well, I'm surprised you didn't wait until I got here. Well, you must have on a new outfit or something that you want everybody to see. So, okay. <laughs> and, and we're just doing announcements. We wouldn't think about starting without you. Okay. There you go. Uh, all seriousness, a uh, couple of updates. Mike Mora ha uh, did have surgery yesterday, and I got a text message a while ago. He is on his way home. Uh, Harvey Page was going to Huntsville to uh, 
uh, get Mike and get him back home. And so that's, uh, that's really, really uh, good news. He uh, had uh, been waiting for that surgery, had it, and uh, did really well, and is, uh, is they're on their way home, even as, even as we uh, speak. Uh, Benton Willoughby, this is Craig and Kim LeCroy's great nephew, will start uh, the gene therapy uh, this coming Monday uh, for uh, his muscular dystrophy, and they uh, will start with an infusion, and that will be this coming Monday. So uh, remember little Benton uh, Willoughby in your prayers. Mel and Betty Barham have been moved to Encompass there on Highway 72. They've been moved there for physical therapy. Not sure uh, the duration at this point, but they're both out of the hospitals and uh, out of the hospital and are very uh, blessed that they're, they're able to be together and uh, left the hospital and are, are at the, uh, uh, the uh, therapy place there uh, for, uh, for the next little while. So continue to remember them. Bobby Hayden had his two week checkup today following his uh, heart surgery. Uh, got a good report. He'll go back in another two weeks and so uh, he seems to be doing, he seems to be doing fine. Are there any others that we might not know about? Yes, Jim. Okay. Sure. What's her name? Jennifer Schwarz, this is Jim's uh, sister in Central Florida uh, and had, is having some hip issues. A joint keeps popping out and uh, she's headed for hip replacement surgery. So uh, we'll remember her. Let's bow. Gracious Father, we do pause uh, thanking you for the opportunity to be together tonight. We, we readily acknowledge uh, these uh, conditions and situations of... of uh, loved ones and, and uh, church members and people that we care so much about and are thankful uh, for the improvement that uh, all of these are making. We are mindful, Father, of uh, still others who are in the process of taking treatments and uh, we pray for them in a very, very special way. Uh, we're mindful, Father, of still others who are awaiting uh, procedures and surgeries. We pray that they too uh, would be uh, better as a result of these, uh, uh, of these various procedures. Uh, we're mindful, Father, of, of still others who, are, who are, are not able to be here because uh, they're confined at home, and uh, we're, we pray for them. Still others who are away and are traveling, and we pray for their safety. We're thankful, Father, for, for your word, and we ask for uh, your uh, guidance and direction as we study tonight. We pray, Father, that there'll be something within even this familiar text, that there'll be something there that we've never noted before. And uh, as always, that there would be a truth or an insight that uh, we would incorporate, have the willingness to incorporate uh, in our lives. All these things we ask in your son's name. Amen. Okay, we want to get back uh, to... Uh, John chapter 20, and uh, we, we got as far uh, last week as uh, where Jesus has uh, basically called Mary Magdalene's name, and she has finally, it has finally dawned on her exactly who she's, who she's talking to, and uh, we want to look at, um, we're supposed to start at verse 17, but I wanted to take this as kind of an opportunity to let, let's, let's be clear because I think what happens a lot of times, anytime we, uh, we, we read any of the resurrection narratives, it doesn't matter in which of the Gospels, 1 Corinthians 15, any of the, uh, the, the great uh, texts that talk about this, it's, uh, you know, the last thing we want is for it to become uh, so... Uh, familiar that we lose sight of exactly what's going on here and uh, because when we talk about the uh, the resurrection of Jesus we are talking about the one of the key events not just in the Gospels not just in the Bible but throughout all human history that that we're still uh, reaping the uh, you know the benefits and the and the the, the results of, of that great event 
And, and we spent a little time last week talking about the irony of the fact that, that we mentioned that the, that the women were the last ones at the cross and they were the first ones uh, at the tomb. And, and Matthew's gospel you know, records this. Luke's does. John does, does so in, in, his, in his own way. Uh, you know, there will be a company of women that, will, uh, that had, had certainly would, would join Mary Magdalene but, uh, you know, she's the first one there. And uh, in, in, in this uh, text that, that, we looked, that we looked at last week, uh, the, uh, you know, we combine that with, with Luke's account. Initially, when Mary Magdalene and these other women got back and, and said, the Lord is, 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 has, been, has been raised, he, he, he's, you know, he's been, re- he's been resurrected, the initial response was, hmm, they, in fact, Luke says they seem to be, uh, you know, the, the characteristics of, of a wild, uh, of a wild story, and uh, and and so it's it's it is ironic, and it's not as if the resurrection was this marginal event, so so you could let this you know obscure woman named Mary Magdalene uh, be an eyewitness. The resurrection. It is the event without which, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, there is no Christianity. And without the resurrection, there is no salvation and there is no forgiveness. And there, you know, the resurrection of Jesus Christ was, was, was God's um, affirmation, if you will, that everything that Jesus did uh, culminated on the cross had had you know, was, was, was stamped. It was basically validated at that point. Uh, the resurrection ultimately demonstrates the atonement of sin, uh, the, the victory over death, and uh, the reality of eternal life. And, and so the, the, the bottom line is, and I say this because we, we constantly have to deal with uh, skepticism that's been around a long time of, of trying to, to undermine or chip away at the, uh, uh, the validity of the bodily resurrection of Jesus. And it's impossible, and, and I try to be careful about using inclusive statements, but it is impossible to be a Christian and not believe in the resurrection. Now you may call yourself a Christian and deny the bodily resurrection of Jesus, and you may be something, but you ain't a Christian. And, and uh, you know, Paul had said in Romans 4, excuse me, Romans 1 in verse 4, God declared Jesus as the Son of God, how so? With power by the resurrection from the dead. Uh, Romans 10, verse 10, and if you confess him as Lord and believe in your heart, that what? That God raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. So you can't be a Christian and deny the, uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, and it's that event that so validates uh, the sacrifice of Christ. Uh, you know, all the animal sacrifices, everything that the Jews had done to that point uh, were ineffective from the standpoint of taking away sin. The Hebrew writer tells us that uh, in, in, in Hebrews 10. And, and so like I said, if... If, there, if there's you know, no resurrection, then there's no salvation, there's no Christianity. Uh, and and if, you know, if one writer said, if Jesus didn't rise, then he lied. And, and this is basically a summation of, of, what, of what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. So I would point you back to that great chapter if you'd like to, uh, uh, to do any kind of follow-up. But uh, what's amazing is throughout the course of history... Uh, there have been all these efforts to try to explain away what we're reading here in John chapter 20. Uh, a favorite in the, uh, in the 18th and on into the 19th century, and we talked about it a couple of weeks ago, I can't believe this is even still around, was called the swoon theory. And it argued that Jesus really didn't die. Uh, he, went into some, <clears throat> he went into some kind of, of semi-coma. And he was taken down from the cross and he was buried while he was still alive. And, and then they, they you know, wrapped him in the cloths and the spices 
and, and, and it was the coolness of the tomb that basically revived him. So he, he woke up, he rolled the stone away, he took on a, a, a group of soldiers and then went to the disciples and told them he'd risen from the dead. Does anybody see a problem with this? Well, yeah, obviously, uh, it, it's, um, it, it, you know, the, Jesus had been so weakened by the, uh, the scourging, uh, not to mention, you know, what he, what he lost while he was on the cross. And, and then three days without food and water, he was able to free himself from the grave clothes, which, by the way, Lazarus couldn't do in John 11. And, and Jesus, you know, would have had to have gotten somebody to, uh, to loose the, uh, the, the grave clothes. And then he rolled away the stone and he overpowered the Roman guard and then took a long, you know, little stroll to Emmaus in, uh, in, in, in Luke 24, seven miles away, right, on nail-pierced feet. You, you know, the whole thing is, is, just, is just ridiculous. Uh, as one writer said, it confirms what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. There's a second view that was, that was uh, equally popular. How? We're not really sure. It was called the hallucination theory. The hallucination theory states that it was the followers of Jesus that were so overwhelmed with grief and so overwhelmed with sorrow that they, they wanted so desperately for him to be alive that they just imagined it. They literally hallucinated uh, their own way into, into, into believing uh, that he had actually uh, been raised from the dead. Well, the problem with that uh, is, is, you know, hallucinations are kind of individual. You don't have group hallucinations, I don't think, right? But Jesus had 10, count them, 10 post-resurrection appearances. Uh, he appeared to uh, various numbers of people, including 500 at one time, and all having, you know, the same result, the same conclusion. Uh, the, these were not the results of, of some hallucination. Well, because those two didn't work, and I, for obvious reasons, somebody came up with another one. Uh, this one is equally uh, intelligent, and it's called the wrong tomb theory. Now, yeah, you're looking at me like that, and, and I'm thinking there are supposedly educated, learned people who have come up with these things, uh, and, and uh, basically what they're saying is, Matthew 28, John 20, the women basically went to the wrong tomb. Well, wait a minute. Uh, you know, you, you've also got to acknowledge it wasn't just the women but Joseph and Nicodemus anointed the body and wrapped it in the grave clothes and then they put it in the wrong tomb. Well, whose tomb was it, by the way? It was Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. So it starts with Nicodemus and Joseph put him in the wrong tomb. Uh, and then, of course, the women went to the wrong tomb. And then Peter and John went to the wrong tomb. Everybody went to the wrong tomb. You know how to, how to shoot that theory uh, down, uh, or, or even if you want to just shoot down the, the, even the theory of, of the resurrection, why don't you go to the right tomb and point to the body? That seems to be pretty obvious to me. Instead of coming up with all these alternatives, just, just find the right one and roll the stone away and, and, and show the body. If they went to the wrong tomb, well, then his body ought to still be in, in, in some tomb somewhere over there. You know, the Romans would have known the right tomb. Why? Because they had a guard there. The Sanhedrin would have known the right tomb. Why? Because they insisted that Pilate put a guard there. Yes, sir. Oh sure, yeah. What it was, you know, the women were, wit, yeah, they witnessed what Joseph and, Aram, Joseph and Nicodemus did, and so they knew where the tomb was. Um, 
<laughs> yeah. You got the wrong end of the cross. Yeah. As long as it's been stabbed in with the spear. They are under a death penalty if these crucified people aren't dead. Yep. Yep. You got the soldiers. <laughs> Hold that thought. <laughs> because, yeah, it, it, it gets worse. Yeah. And it's the same thing. It is. And it, get, it gets worse. Uh, the one, the one theory that still now we would sit here and go, ah, oh, those idiots! How could they come up with that? Okay, th they said, okay, if you don't buy that, then buy this one, and it's the one that that you can go and and look up, and they're still holding on to this one, and that is that the disciples stole the body, and that's basically who started that rumor. Uh, the, the chief priest, yeah. The Jewish leaders started that one. The, the, the disciples stole the body. Remember in Matthew 28, uh, you know, when, when the, the soldiers went to the chief priest and they said the earthquake came, we were all asleep, and we don't know how to explain it. We don't know what happened when we woke up. What? He was gone. And the Jewish leaders said, here's what you're going to say. While you were asleep, uh, they stole the body. Now, that's problematic right out of the gate. Why? How you, if you're asleep, how do you know what happened to it? You know, but they said that's what you say. And don't worry about Pilate. We're going we're gonna to take care of that. We'll take care of that with him. Uh, you just go and tell everybody that the disciples stole the body. We'll give you this money. Uh, and, and Matthew 28, verse 15 confirms all this. And, and it is still... Here, here we are, April 2024. It is still the dominant view. And it was even, uh, you know, even on into the late first century. So, you know, they'll do anything to deny the resurrection. And here's the other one that uh, I think is rather interesting. And I, I ran across this one the other day, and it was just one of those, you know, just hit yourself in the head moment because I had thought about and had read all these other reasons why the disciples would not have done that. But to me, this one was, was really foundational. The reason uh, this view doesn't work is because the disciples didn't even expect a resurrection. So why would they steal the body if they didn't even really expect? And how do we know that? How do we know they didn't really expect him to be resurrected? Yeah, every time somebody told them. I mean, go back to what we read last week. When Mary Magdalene is at the tomb, she keeps asking what? Where have you taken the body? What she never says is, maybe he was resurrected. So it never, at this point... That the idea that the disciples would have fought through all the danger of getting around a, a, a Roman garrison, I mean, guard of soldiers and, 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 and rob a grave and steal a body, they wouldn't have never done that. Why? Because they didn't expect a, re a resurrection. They didn't expect it. Well, that one was problematic. So the last one they came up with was, well, uh, the Romans stole the body. Well, that's borderline ridiculous too. Why would the Romans steal the body? What point would they have uh, in doing that? They didn't expect anything from Jesus. Why would they fake a resurrection for a religion that they didn't even care about? Uh, you know, none, none of this works. On the positive side, yeah, Brad? Right. I mean, at the, you're right because they were at the, they were they were were willing to, and in fact, did lose their life based on on the reality of the resurrection. Why would you put your life on the line for something that you weren't really sure even happened? Now, uh, said all that to to point us back now to John chapter twenty. 
This is where we left off last week. Uh, Mary is, is standing outside the tomb and, and, and she's weeping. And uh, what's interesting about this is uh, the idea of, of, as I mentioned last week, uh, it's not shedding a tear, it's unrestrained sobbing. She, it, it's, just, it, it's just uncontrollable uh, in that regard. And, and the reason why she is crying, and because, you know, the angel will ask her, why are you crying? And her answer is what? Somebody has, has, taken, his, has taken his body. Um, J.C. Ryle once wrote, uh, two-thirds of the things we fear in life never happen. Two-thirds of the tears we shed are thrown away in vain. Her tears are for the tears of a broken heart, forlorn, frustrated, lonely, not understanding anything that had happened, having lost the object of her faith. So she looks in, she saw two angels in white, one at the head and one at the feet where the body of Jesus had been laid. Matthew 16, by the way, says uh, that the angel uh, was a young man. And, and Luke 24 says that there were two young men. And uh, uh, she likely didn't know that these men were angels. Uh, but what would she think they were doing in the tomb? Maybe they had had a part in moving his body. So she's, she's, she's weeping. Her, her eyes are, are, are blurred. Uh, it's in the early morning, and, and, and you know the shadowed interior of the tomb would make things difficult to see. And, and so she sees what are angels, but they're in human form. She doesn't really know who they are. Uh, and, and by the way, that's another proof, uh, the presence of angels uh, is, is proof that the tomb had not been ransacked, uh, that the body had not been stolen. So uh, she looks in there, and there is the place where the body had been, and an angel was at, you know, at each end of that. The angel says to her, verse 13, we looked at this last week, Woman, why are you weeping? And woman there is a, is a term of dignity. It's not the 20th century colloquial English term. It's, it's a term of dignity. And she said, because they've taken away my Lord and I do not know where they've laid him. Again, no idea of what? Resurrection. No thought of a resurrection. Even though Jesus had said he would rise, they just... They just couldn't wrap their, 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 their mind around it at that point. Uh, so she's convinced somebody has, has stolen the body. She don't know who it, you know, she doesn't know who it is, but she's, uh, she's despondent, she's brokenhearted. And, and here again, uh, verse 14. When she said this, when she said what? They have taken him away and I don't know where they've laid him. Uh, she turned around and there, as we said last week, Jesus is standing there, and uh, there is that, that, that one statement. And, and here again, uh, verse 15, Jesus asked her what? Same question. Same question that the, that the angels uh, ask her. And that is, why are you weeping? And then Jesus adds, adds whom are you seeking? And John says she supposed him, she thought he was the gardener. Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will, I will take him away. See, she's sure that what? She's sure that he's dead. And somebody else has moved the body. Right. They watched him die on the cross. Sure. What other thought could you have? I, and that, that's it. I, I, yeah, I don't want to sound critical or, or, you know, but at the same time. But what he had told them or how many times he had suggested, they saw all this take place. And right, but, but I, I guess his point would have been, 
How many of them had been standing there outside of Lazarus' tomb just a week before? Well, no, that's true, but he'd been, he'd been in there for four days. And so it's, and, and by the way, we, 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 we noted this then. Lazarus is, all of the details about Lazarus' resurrection uh, was a foreshadowing of Jesus. When you read John 11 uh, about Jesus, I mean, about Lazarus being raised, it, it, it is, it, it's just kind of a trailer of what was to come. So, no, not, not overly critical, but, but, you know, I kind of flip back and forth. I'm thinking, okay, but, but is there not? This is why John has already said, he, he peeks inside, he sees the grave clothes and everything, and he saw all that and believed. But he's alone on that one right now. Until, until, uh, you know, Jesus calls her by name, and, and by the way, uh, Mary is the uh, Aramaic equivalent of the old Hebrew word Miriam. Uh, Miriam, of course, was the, the sister of Moses. Pretty common, pretty common name. And, uh, you, know, you know, whether he said it to her in Hebrew or in Aramaic, probably Aramaic, but uh, she recognized his voice. Yes, sir. Right. The Roman. Yeah. One of the other gospels mentions it being Tobit. Yeah. The significance of that is not that it was tossed aside, mm -mm. but under tradition of the time, if the master folded his napkin after a meal, he was coming back. Mm -hmm. If he just wadded it up and threw it on the table, he's not coming back. Right. The servant that's right. Yep. So and another it is, and, and it, it also harkens back to uh, the Passover meal. And uh, even even today, even today in Orthodox uh, circles that that observe the Passover meal, uh, the head of the household will will get ready for the meal, and everybody is is uh, uh, is seated about to be seated around the table. He will take. Uh, a piece of that bread, a piece of that matzah, and he will fold it up in a linen napkin and he'll hide it. It's what they call the alfikoman. The alfikoman. And they, he'll hide it somewhere around the table or in the room and near the end of the meal, he'll tell the children, okay, now you can go look. And they'll start looking, and they'll look under the chairs, and they'll look, and they'll look, and, and until one of the one of the children will find that napkin, and inside of that napkin is is that bread. And and they'll bring it back, to, bring it back to the father or the grandfather, and and then they get a they get a prize because they they found it. And, and so there's a tremendous amount of symbolism that that's that's at work here. Uh, because the bread was hidden, folded up in the linen and, and hidden away, and then, of course, brought out uh, at, at, at the proper time. Uh, and so that's what's happening here, and, and Jesus calls her by name, and, and of course, uh, we, we know, based on Matthew 28, uh, she, she falls at his feet because Matthew 28 tells us that all the women did that. All of them fell at his feet, and they took hold of his feet. Matthew says they took hold of his feet and worshipped him. They just put their arms around, around his feet and, 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 and they were worshipping him. And that's what Mary does here. I've seen this recreated uh, in, in some uh, you know, movies. And, and, and you know, she just immediately throws her arms around his neck. and she, mm -mm, No, that's not it. That, that goes against what Matthew says. Matthew says, no she would immediately have fallen to the ground. And that makes more sense when she calls him rabbi or master teacher. And this is even more so why Jesus would say, verse 17, and the old King James misses it here because he, they translate it, touch me not, 
for I've not yet ascended to the Father. No, the verb there is not, is not about, you know, it means don't, don't cling to me. It, it wasn't anything, it wasn't like he was, you know, electrostatic or something, you know. I've heard some really strange interpretations there. He wasn't glowing, you know. Uh, no, he's just saying, look, don't, don't, don't hang all over me. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. There's that interpretation, but there's also another interesting one. And I, I love this one too. When he says, uh, in fact, one, the, the, one uh, good translation of that is, stop clinging to me. It's a strong word. Stop clinging to me. Why? For I've not yet ascended to the Father. Meaning what? Why would he say that? Well, the, the, the one thought is, okay, you don't have to hold on to me. I'm, I'm not leaving right now. That, that's one. The other one is, don't keep holding on to me because I can't stay. And I like that one. I like that one. Because what has he said near the end, for the latter third of John's gospel, what, is he, what, is, what has he been telling his disciples? Got to go away. Can't stay. So he tells Mary Magdalene, don't, don't grab me hard. Don't, don't hold on to me because I got to go. I'm ascending back to my father. You're, you're not going to be able to keep me from going. So you, you've got a couple of options there, and, and I think both are, uh, both are, are certainly... Uh, consistent in, uh, in, in, in this. And, and instead, he tells her what? Sir. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Will. Yeah, that, that, yeah, that's it. I think, I think that's it, yeah. He, and, and here again, what's it, if, if you look at this, and here again, it depends on who you consult, there are some who believe that it was at this point that Jesus ascended and then came back. Well, the problem with that is what? You know, th this is Sunday morning. Sunday afternoon, he's going where? On the road to Emmaus. And then Sunday night, he's going to be in the upper room. So, no, he, he's just saying, I think, to your point, look, you, you, you know, I, I've been telling you all this time, I'm, I'm, going, I'm, I'm going back to my father. And so, yeah, this is great, but to your paraphrase, you ain't seen nothing yet. And, and what's funny, not funny, but what's ironic about that is, and we've talked about this on numerous occasions, you fast forward to Acts 1, and it finally registers with them that Jesus has said, look, the only way the kingdom can come is if what? Is if I leave. And so those brilliant minds, <laughs> this is before Pentecost, right? Okay, before the Spirit, they said, Lord, will you now at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? In other words, what? When are you leaving? Of all time, I mean, of all times for, for it to finally register with them, and they're basically saying, you know, if you would hurry up and leave, we would see the kingdom. And as I've, all, I've always said in my own inarticulate way, if I had been Jesus, that's not a good thing to do, by the way. Ask yourself, what if I had been Jesus? You know, I, I would go... Might as well go, you know, morons. Uh, but he didn't. He, he was very uh, patient and loving in that regard. But, yeah, she, you know, he, he tells her, uh, go and, and tell uh, my brethren. And by the way, that's the first time. Let me double check that. Where's my Bible? If you'll look at that in... Uh,
Yes, verse, uh, that's verse 17. Uh, but go to my brethren and say to them, I'm ascending to my father uh, and your father and to my God and your God. That's the first time, first time that Jesus uses the term brothers or brethren uh, in, 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 that, in that context. First time in John's gospel. Um, and so she does. And, and this is where, of course, we would pick up the parallel in, in Luke's gospel. <clears throat> the women go and they tell the apostles, they tell the disciples what? We have, we have seen it. We've seen the Lord. And uh, I, I go back to verse 10. It's verse 10 of Luke 24. These words appeared to them as nonsense. And they would not believe them. See, it goes back to that, that whole thing, and, and it, it, it took a while for it to register, uh, but that's why the, the whole thought that the disciples would have stolen the body is ludicrous. Why? Because they didn't expect a resurrection. They didn't expect it. They didn't even believe when somebody they knew pretty well said what? Not the tomb is empty, what did, what, did, what did these women tell them? I saw him. I saw him. You know, and we're not talking about Elvis working at a Burger King up in Kalamazoo, Michigan. You know, you know that lingered around for I don't know how long. Uh, after 1977, uh, we kept getting Elvis sightings all over, the, all over the country. No, we're not talking about that. I mean, they... they we saw him. You know, it, it's, you know, Mary Magdalene said, I touched him. Frank? And, and, you know, they couldn't. They couldn't because they have been paid off and have basically said, what? Well, somebody stole his body. But I, I agree, if, if he appeared to more than 500 at one time, word had to have gotten around, and, and you wonder at this point how many of those uh, of that execution squad would have at least had reason to, yeah, maybe, yeah, to, to, that, to that point. Um, so... She does that, right? She goes, let's look at uh, uh, verse 19. And uh, let's say, yeah. On the evening of that day, this was still, and, and, and John tells us, on the first day of the week. And by the way, here again, we talked about this the other day, uh, about was John uh, reflecting Jewish time or was he reflecting Roman? Well, here... Uh, he, he's indicating what? Roman. Roman time. Because according to the Jewish clock, uh, Sunday would have ended when? Six o'clock. Six o'clock on Sunday evening. And we know for a fact that with the two on the road to Emmaus, it had already gotten nighttime. Right? It was, it was in fact, there's a beautiful expression there in, in Luke 24. And I, I just... I love that, uh, that, that whole narrative. Uh, they get to their home and uh, uh, they're going to turn in and Jesus is continuing to go down the road. And, and they, they, they beckoned, they called out to him and said, no, 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 don't, don't, don't leave, stay with us. For uh, the day, in fact our English says, for the day is far spent. Uh, that misses the idiomatic expression there, the language. What they, what they really said was, uh, uh, the day has gone to bed. Meaning what? It's dark. It's dark. James? Just so that I do note the fact that it was the first day of the week. Yes. Were not all his appearances on the first day? Yes. Of the yeah. And, and by the way, uh, James said we're not, yeah. And the interesting thing about it, over the next 40 days, Jesus only appears to believers. When you go back to 1 Corinthians 15 and read the catalog of, of who Jesus you know, reveals himself to, 
It's just to believers. The one exception, of course, would be whom? Yeah, Saul on the road to Damascus. At the time that Jesus reveals himself to him, Saul's not a believer. But everybody else that Jesus appears before are, are, are believers. And, and I think that's significant. So it is the evening of that, that Sunday night. And you think about, boy, it's been a full day. Um, Jesus uh, is resurrected. Uh, he uh, appears to, to Mary Magdalene and to these other women. Uh, and the question is, where does he go from that point until sun, Sunday afternoon on the road to Emmaus? Well, you know, we're not, we're not told. I think so. I think, yeah. Uh, in fact, we have, we, we've referenced, you know, for the longest time, uh, you know, Easter notoriously, uh, not notoriously, but consistently has been called Resurrection Sunday. When in reality, uh, you know, just about all of them are in, in that regard. Um, but he, you know, he, he walks the seven miles uh, from, from Jerusalem to Emmaus, when they recognize him, he disappears and then is, is back in Jerusalem. And, and now, uh, uh, verse 19, uh, the doors were being, uh, the doors, uh, being shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. And Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Now, that um, greeting... Is, is, pretty, is pretty typical in, uh, in, in Jewish circles. Uh, he would have, you know, the familiar, the, you know, shalom. Uh, if, if he was addressing, uh, uh, you know, a, a group, he would have, if he was... Yeah, in, in, in Aramaic, in, in, in Hebrew, it's a mashaloka, uh, which uh, literally is... It's funny about that because we, we, we have that, uh, that, that definition, peace, uh, peace be with you. It's a paraphrase. Mashalom ka literally means, what is your peace? It's a question. Uh, and we think that's far removed from us in our culture. We do the same thing. What's up? How's it going? Are you doing okay? You know. Everything okay? Having a good day? We've got all kind of greetings that are, that are questions. We're not really wanting an answer, right? We don't really want you to stop and bore us with all the bad things that are going on in your life, for the most part, <laughs> usually. Uh, I think there are probably some of you that are more sincere about that than the rest of us. But, yeah, mashalom ka, what is your peace? And, and that's what, but it's also... What follows uh, is John's uh, record of the Great Commission. This is, this is John's installment of the Great Commission. Uh, Luke gives his parallel in, in Luke 24, 46 and 47. Matthew's is where? Matthew 28, right? And, and the Great Commission in Matthew 28 uh, is spoken to the 11 on the mountain in Galilee, uh, and, and of course that would form, help form the longer ending of, of Mark's gospel in, in Mark 16. Uh, but but this, is, this is John's installment, if you will, of, of, of the Great Commission. And uh, peace be with you. And when he said this, he showed them his, uh, his hands and his side, and then his disciples were glad uh, when they saw the Lord. And then verse 21, peace be with you as the Father has sent me, even so I send you. There's the Great Commission. And repeatedly, throughout John's gospel, he has said over and over what the Father has, has uh, that Jesus was sent from the Father. And, and so now there he is, uh, resurrected from the dead, and, and he is sending forth his uh, his, you know, his, his disciples. And by the way, this commission here was not limited 
uh, to the ten apostles. How do we know? Because Luke 24 verse 33 tells us there were others that were in that upper room. It wasn't just the apostles. Right, if it's the same group that we, that we would see after the ascension, yeah. Acts, Acts 1 tells us there were 120 in there, including his mother and his brothers, interestingly enough. So it's not limited to, to just the apostles, but uh, it is, you know, there were others that were, that were in that setting and uh, there to proclaim uh, what? That Jesus Christ uh, is the Son of God. But they couldn't do this on their own. And so this sets up verse 22. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to read this, but then you got a little homework. You got a little homework before next week. Verse 22, and actually 22 and 23 are, 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 are really awesome. Uh, he breathes on them, and I think John records that because the word for breath and spirit is the same whether it's in Greek or Hebrew. The same word. Same word. Breath or spirit. And so he breathes on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now, what's problematic about that, that one verse that, 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 you know, take 22 and, and uh, uh, you know, 22 and 23 together. Uh, verse 23 uh, has been really problematic through the course of church history because certain folks through the course of time have used verse 23 to teach here that Jesus basically was directing uh, church leaders uh, to, to use uh, the power of absolution. You know, if you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven. If you retain the sin, in other words, it's pretty well left up to you. And, it, you know, he would have said that to, they say, well, he was saying that to the apostles, and then later on uh, in, in Catholicism, the Pope and the bishops would have carried that on because they were the successors to the apostles. Okay. Right out of the gate, it's a problem. Why? Because he wasn't just talking to his apostles. But they take that to mean, because of apostolic succession, here it is right here. Here's, here's, here's the beginning of absolution. No. We know it's not that. Um, and, and, and yet, uh, as I said, more than the ten apostles... Uh, were present uh, in the room. So it couldn't have been that. So the question is, what does he mean by that? We'll put a mark there, and we'll pick up here next week. And don't come in here next week and just look at me when I ask you, what did you find out? It's a, it, it is. I mean, it's, it's worth the time to, to delve into it. So we'll pick up here next week.